Outrocast. Thank you for taking the time. Obviously been listening to your music for a long, long, long time now. And there's so much happening for you. But first, let's talk about the New Jersey show, the one that you have coming up at the university. Uh, is there yeah. anything special about that gig? Is it you solo on stage? Well, I do a different show every night, so I really don't know what I'm going to do on that on that show. I will be doing songs from American Boys. And then I'll be I'll have my five piece group. We have, you know, twin electric guitars, keyboards, bass, drums, and me. Of course, my guitar is acoustic, and I drive the whole thing. So uh, yeah, we have a big sound and uh, a lot of songs that are very famous, and yes. a lot of songs that aren't. Um, <laughs> but maybe <it> will be. <laughs> So you mentioned American Boys, which is getting its release in May, yet I believe you have 16 titles coming out through Bob Franks. That's right. Um, and it's very exciting because uh, at this moment, um, to have this album out, and I think that it's going to get quite a bit of attention, uh, and then to follow that up with these other albums that have some of them have been available and some of them haven't. Um, I think it's going to be quite a, a, a nice time for people that like my music if they want to get these records because uh, they're, and they're all on vinyl too, which is, mm -hmm. uh, I'm excited about that myself. So that speaks to your business acumen, the fact that you're able to get the rights to your catalog back like that, to have a say in your publishing, because a lot of the yeah. art you started with, they ultimately had to give up the control just because they took a couple of thousand dollars in advance. When did you get your stuff back or did you have it all along? Did you have the control? I, I always had reversion clauses, except for the first six albums that I made for United Artists Records, which were the, probably the most famous albums I made, Homeless Brother, Tapestry, American Pie, the Don McLean album, Playing mm -hmm. Favorites. Uh, these are still... Uh, owned by uh, United Artists through Universal uh, Records, but I control those albums. They can't do anything with them without my permission. And the rest of them, and then another, another 15 or more albums, I always had reversion clauses. I always recorded them for my own corporation, uh, never imagining that, uh, number one, that there, there would be something like streaming platforms where every right. single track would be available. And number two, there would be a deal like this that would come along, which would have a re-release in vinyl and CD. And I, I, I really made some decisions that I felt were the right thing for me, but I didn't realize how, how good those decisions would be until many, many, several decades later, because I didn't want to give my publishing up on, on the right. first album, the tap, the tapestry album, and uh, so I got turned down a lot because of that. But eventually, eventually found a great company to release tapestry and uh, held on to my publishing, uh, and uh, then got it all back about thirty years ago. So that that publishing catalog alone uh, is uh, very valuable, and then there are all the other things I have, the albums that I own, and the trademarks that I own and uh, the various uh, different video um, uh, enterprises, you know, like uh, right. live live performances and this and that. Yeah, that's all under the same, same heading. Well, speaking of the publishing, that has to do with you being covered and being sampled and also parried parodied by major artists for decades now. Do you remember the first artist of note who covered you? Um, yeah, a lot of artists covered Vincent right away. Mm -hmm. and, a, and a few sang American Pie. And I remember some did uh, Winter Wood and, you know, some of these early, uh, many, many, many. Uh, did uh, and I love you so. Uh, right. Not as many did, did castles in the air as you would think might do. Um, did, they didn't. I was surprised at that. But I didn't even think about it. You know, I just kept rolling along and doing whatever project was next. I didn't. 
I don't sit around and 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 do business calculations of any kind. I just <laughs> I held on to the I held on, I held on to the publishing because I loved those songs and they were mine and I didn't want someone else publishing them. It's a very simple reason, not because I thought they would be valuable. I'd have to imagine you're the only artist to have been covered or sampled by both Elvis and Drake. And Weird Al. <laughs> and Weird Al. Yeah, so Weird Al was actually a point of curiosity for me. Did you immediately love and embrace Weird Al's cover? I like Weird Al. I like what he does. And he's very unweird. He's a very normal person. He's just a little crazy when he puts on his Weird Al thing. But he's um, he's a very uh, normal, lovely man. And in fact, he was, during the pandemic, they had my uh, Hollywood star ceremony, which was almost going to have to be inside because of the pandemic. And Al showed up and was funny and spoke about about me. And uh, so, yeah, he's, he's a very nice man. Another thing that intrigues me about your career is that early on, your agent was a future legendary manager, David Krebs. Do you remember working with David early on? David was never my manager, but David was my agent at William Morris. And uh, I had a I had a crazy manager, a guy named Herb Gart, mm -hmm. who had a lot of talent, but he did not have a, a business ability to keep to keep things afloat. And unfortunately, but he, he let me just show you how far out of the mainstream that I was. Is this guy Herb Gart? Mm -hmm. His office, his office was a phone booth that returned quarters. <laughs> so wow. he was like Max Bialy, he was like Max Bialy stock in the producers. I don't know if you've ever seen Zero Mostel. Yeah. In the producers, well, that's what what he was like, and he'd be he was a heavy set guy, and he'd be occupying the entire uh, girth of the whole inside of the. Uh, uh, phone booth, and he and people would be lying about that. Get the hell out of there! Banging on the thing, you know. And he'd be he'd be there all morning, hours and hours. He'd be calling, making calls, and everybody knew him because he was one of those people. Uh, there were a number of those guys who would bring talent to record companies and agencies. He was like a scout in a way, mm -hmm. going out. And he he found me, or actually, I found him. I found him. Because uh, I first worked with Harold Leventhal, and then I worked with a guy named Len Rosenfeld, who was next door to Herb Gart, and I decided that Herb was more interesting, so I went with him, and uh, I, you know, he was he really loved what I did, and he really uh, nurtured what I did, but he he did some things that were wrong, and after a long time, about eighteen years, I had to say goodbye to him, but. During that time we were together, he knew this agent, David Krebs, and um, who later on was involved with the Aerosmith and did Beatlemania and became quite a, a powerhouse. And David Krebs, uh, now I was signed with William Morris around the time of my release of the Tapestry album, and he, he got a lot of work for me. I was on the road every weekend with Steppenwolf, Three Dog Night, um, Ten Wheel Drive, the James Gang, uh, you know, all kinds of cats, you know, in the bus. So I was a lot of time I spent with the, the original Blood, Sweat and Tears, and I enjoyed that very much. They were great to be around, and they had they made beautiful music. They all made great music. I mean, Steppenwolf was a lot of fun to watch uh, every night. So it was a great beginning for me. And then I scored very big with Pat with American Pie, and then I didn't need any of that anymore. Now I was filling these places myself. Yeah, what David told me when I asked him about you, he said, oh, he was happy to to just go on stage himself and get $300 a night. He was great to work with. <laughs> that was his memory of you. I was amazed at the, um, the upside of show business. Mm -hmm. You know, I had no idea that the sky is the limit. I mean, now you look at people like Springsteen, they make $2 million a show. 
Yeah. You know, and people like this make millions of dollars every night with their big shows. Um, uh, you know, and, and by comparison, I'm I'm still a three hundred dollar a night guy because you know I I, spend, I fill theaters and the, and it's not, I make a great income, but sure. you know nothing like that. Well, that ties into you know I have two more questions before I let you go, and the the first one is sure. we talked about the value of your catalog, which has absolutely sustained you for many years in a greatest of ways. Now. The early 80s is the rise of MTV, and you were obviously not a music video artist, although you did tape video-based content and concerts over the years. How did you know not to chase trends that you were going to be okay long-term? Because I believe in myself, and I believe in the integrity of what I do, and I am able to assess what's around me, Mm -hmm. and... And I can say to myself, look, I'm better than these guys. I sing better than they do. I write better than they do. I make better records. Uh, it, 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 and they, and I will be fine. You know, I will be fine because really what keeps you going uh, is the integrity of what you've done. Mm-hmm. It finds its way out there. It finds its way out. You know, it's like it finds its way out and it gets used. This is why the Drake thing is rather interesting i've never spoken to drake but he's a phenomenon in fact now i'm supposed to get a a platinum album award for the fact that do it wrong is going 10 million <laughs> and they have a thing called they have a thing called platinum now and, and uh but anyway that that those two songs that i wrote that were on the primetime album which is an album that really didn't sell um do that the songs were when a when a good thing goes bad and uh the wrong thing to do those were two songs that i wrote on the primetime album he used those two songs to write the song do it wrong which was the single from uh the album which went 10 million <clears throat> and uh so i end up i own a large part of that song right so that's that's the advantage of publishing. Um, you once you have that, you can you can um, control things. You can control how things are used. You can stop usages that are stupid, <laughs> and you can encourage ones that are good. And you can stop bootlegging. You can do all sorts of things you can do with the power of being a publisher. Music real estate, they call it. And the the last yeah, the last question I have for you, Don, is all we really know about you is this guy wrote some legendary songs and never stopped touring. We don't know much about you, the human being. What is your decompression or your way to relax when you're not busy with music? Well, there are, there are two books about me. One is called Killing Us Softly with His Song mm-hmm. uh, by Alan Howard which talks a lot, I guess, about my career. And the other is uh, in The American Troubadour. It's a, it's a coffee table book. Mm-hmm. Um, so you get some idea of how I, I, I have properties. I love to decorate homes. I collect antiques and uh, beautiful things. I just love beautiful things. Um, oriental rugs, you know, this kind of stuff. And uh, I decorate these rooms and I have, I have I have a bunch of properties that I, I have done that with. And um, I also, but I don't really go like over the top. And I, I, at some point I stop, you know, like I love cars, but I don't have a hundred cars, you know, <laughs> because it, it becomes crazy. But, um, and, you know, and I, in the past, I've, I've been involved with horses mm-hmm. and Western stuff, Western stuff, you know, Western writing, Western history, Western saddlery, uh, silver work. In fact, at the moment, I'm working with a wonderful man named Ahmad Khan. Mm -hmm. And Ahmad Khan is a brilliant silver and goldsmith who worked for 20 years with the Bolin uh, company. And Bolin was the person that made all the silver saddles and everything. And he has, we are designing different bolos and buckles which he makes for me and uh i'm i'm having a part in that in some cases i'm 
designing the thing. That is a that is a lot of fun for me, and I'm, I'm I, that's one thing I'm doing. Wow, that is all over the place in an amazing way between real estate, decor, <laughs> western stuff. Yeah. You're you're full of surprises, yeah. Tom McLean. Thank you for the decades of great art and really looking forward to what's to come. Congrats on the new album. Well, a great interview. I enjoyed every bit of it. And thank you very much. Outrocast.